for the last few weeks, we've been in the book of Luke. And as we've gone through the book of Luke, we've been learning lessons about having active faith, about loving Christ as he loved others, loved us and loved others, and about following his example. A few weeks ago, we talked about sitting at Jesus' feet and being and desiring to sit at Jesus' feet. And then last week, Pastor Steve brought us a message about the Lord's Prayer. He told us that it was more of a disciple's prayer, more of a prayer that we live, not just something that we read. So this morning, I want to continue the book of Luke. It will be in chapter 12 this morning. And at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus warns his disciples and followers that there are false prophets and false teachers among them, and that they need to be aware of these false teachers, and that they need to make sure that they have the truth that is, is God's truth, and that they're not following after these false doctrines. And so as Jesus is talking, he kind of gets to the end of his, his speech or his teaching, and, he, and I almost feel like he takes a breath. And then he, he gets a question from somebody in the crowd. And there's a young man who's been in this crowd, and of course he's listened to this whole discourse that Jesus has given. And the young man asks Jesus this question, he says, Jesus, tell my brother to give me my inheritance. Now, if I'm listening to this question, and I just know that Jesus has been talking about false prophets and false teaching and doctrine, it kind of tells me that this young man wasn't really listening to what Jesus had to say. It kind of tells me that in his mind, he's going over this question, how to word it, how to say it. Can I get to the front and can I get a question in before Jesus moves on? Um, you know, is the crowd going to disperse and I won't get to ask my question because I want this inheritance. And so it, it kind of tells me that he's been sitting there and not really listening. And it's kind of appropriate that this morning in Sunday school, that's what we were talking about, about having ears but not really hearing. You know, there's a little bit of a difference between hearing and listening. Yeah. Um, my mom used to tell us to put one hand over our ears so that we could hear it and it wouldn't just go yeah. down the other side. <laughs> because that's what, that's what hearing is. Listening means that you kind of absorb what's being said. And obviously, from this question, this young man wasn't really listening to what Jesus had to say. All he was worried about was, I want my inheritance. It also tells us a little bit about him because it tells us that um, he wasn't he wasn't the oldest brother because in the in the biblical times the older brother got a double portion. So this older brother got a double portion, and apparently he had not given the younger brother his portion yet. So once again, all I'm concentrating on me and my needs, and I got to ask Jesus this question, and He needs to make my brother give me the portion that I'm due. So. Jesus, being Jesus, and we know that during his ministry, a lot of times he would answer a question with a question. And Jesus knew this man's heart, and he knew what was going on in this man's heart. And he said, am I really a judge between you and your brother? In other words, is that really what's important? That's what we're talking about right now. And it wasn't. So we pick up this morning in, in Luke chapter 12. And if you'd like to join me, we're going to be reading verses 13 through 21. And in his answer... Jesus told this parable about a rich fool. So we'll begin reading in verse 13 and going through 21 in Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and I will store my surplus grain there. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool." This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. This is the word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Now, it's interesting as we read this parable that Jesus said that the ground yielded this crop. Now, if you have a garden or, or you've lived on a farm before, you know what kind of... Uh, effort and time it takes in preparing the ground and planting the seed and watering and weeding and all of that. So this rich man did not get rich by conniving or deceiving or it wasn't just given to him. He actually had worked the ground. He had worked this farm and the ground was yielding what he had worked for. 
So we see that he, he, he got it by the right means, but he had the wrong attitude towards it. He had done all the sweating and toiling, and now he was seeing the, the rewards of his efforts. But he didn't think about how that happened. He didn't think about God providing the rain, God giving him the strength to go out there in his fields and to, to, to plant and to, to weed. He didn't, he didn't think about all those things. All he thought about was, what am I going to do with all this stuff that I've got now? And then he thought to himself. He was very complex. As a matter of fact, one version I read said he was like in anxiety over what am I going to do, what am I going to do? And it wasn't even about a life decision. It was about what am I going to do with all my stuff? What am I going to do with all this abundance that I have? And then he talks to himself. And I think we see some greed and some pride and some arrogance coming out. Because it's like, what am I going to do? What do I need to do to store this? He didn't think about the fact there were four new people. He didn't think about the fact that there was somebody in his neighborhood that maybe he could have helped. The Bible tells us that he had so much he had to have a place to put it, which meant he already had what he needed. Think about sometimes in your lives when you have what you need, but you want more. And we always want more, though. Everybody wants more. Somebody said, how much money is enough? And he said, just one more piece. Just one more thing. Just one more hundred. One more thousand. One more million. That's how much he made is enough. And so he was thinking never enough, but he had plenty. But he wanted to build bigger barns instead. He didn't have room for it. And he didn't want to do anything with it that would involve the church or would involve God. He didn't seek God in what he needed to do. Think about some time when God has given you an abundance. Do you think about others? Do you think about what you can do to help others? Do you think about what would God have me to do? Or is the first thought, what am I going to do with this stuff? How many of you have watched those coupon shows where people have entire rooms devoted to shelves and shelves and shelves of food? Um, I've watched them before, and it's like, I bought 30 tubes of toothpaste. Okay, so who uses 30 tubes of toothpaste? Or I've got 400 rolls of toilet paper or 600 rolls of paper towel. Why are we doing that? Why are we storing that? I've seen people actually build rooms onto their house or talk about how this is overtaken a room. So they have a living room, and like one entire side of it is full of candidates. That's an overabundance. So we're not seeking what can we do to help others. How can we share the abundance that God has given us? And that's what he was thinking. He wasn't thinking about what he could do for others. What can I do for me? How can I save up things for myself? His barns were already full. He didn't have any need for more. But this is what he said. After he struggled with himself, he's perplexed, and he's anxious, and what am I going to do? He's like, I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns. That's what I'm going to do. Now, in that time, there were their barns were like holes in the ground where they dug holes, and that's where they stored their grain. So instead of instead of using that for someone else, he's like, I'm going to build another barn. I'm going to store that in another barn. I'm going to build bigger ones. I'm going to tear down what I have, and I'm going to build bigger ones. Basically, in essence, he was saying, I've done such a great job that I don't need anybody anymore. I can be self-reliant now. I can take everything that I have and that I've gained, and I can relax now. I don't have to struggle anymore. I don't have to help anybody anymore either. Nobody's helped me. I did all this on my own. I don't have to help anybody anymore. I have no worries. I have confidence in myself now. My happiness is wrapped up in what I've accomplished. This is his thought process. He was going to eat, drink, and be merry. And at that time, that was the thought for the day. People would just eat, drink, and be merry. It wouldn't even take any thought for tomorrow because they had he had this stuff laid up for his tomorrows. He had his future all planned out. How many of you have a future planned out? Anybody? Anybody? But he, had, he thought he had his future planned out. He thought, this is it. I'm done. I'm set. I don't have to do anything anymore. And then we read what God says. God says, you fool, tonight you will be called into account. And then what will happen with everything that you hoarded for yourself? This wretch man foolishly thought that he had a long life. He foolishly thought that everything he had done, all this preparation he had made, was going to take care of himself. He had no thought for God. He had no thought for what he was doing for others. All he thought about was himself. What can I do? What can I store up for myself? How can I provide for me? And how can I make sure that I'm taking care of it? It was all about I, I, I. The Bible tells us that 
talks about several fools in the Bible. It talks about an unbelieving fool in Psalms where it says, the fool is set in his heart and there's no God. It talks about an ignorant fool in the book of Proverbs that despises wisdom. It talks about a self-righteous fool. Someone who thinks that everything they do is right in their own eyes. The Bible also talks about a mocking fool. Someone who scoffs and scorns at Jesus Christ and his truth. And then the Bible talks about a self-sufficient fool who profess to be wise but really a fool. And that's what this name was. He was a self-sufficient fool. Now I don't think that anybody here has a bunch of barns with a lot of grain in them. I don't think anybody here has hordes of things stored away. And I don't think anybody here really talks about the drink and the marriage because I've provided for myself. But what do you think when it comes time to depend on God? Because it's the same thing, it's just a different circumstance. This man was self-reliant on what he had done on his farm and the, the crops that he had gotten for himself. But think about the things that we do in our lives. Think about the times that we say, wow, look what I did. Look what I accomplished. Rather than thanking God for whatever it was that got you to that point. Rather than thanking God for the the energy or the time or the, the mental capacity to deal with something. Think about all of those things that we've done. That's the same thing. It's a self-reliance. And God says, you fool. You can't be self-sufficient and you can not need at the same time. We have to either be one or the other. We either rely on God or we rely on ourselves. God wants us to enjoy life. He doesn't want us to, to, have, to be sad and, and, and not be happy. But he wants us to do that for him. He wants us to live our lives for him in service. You know, the, the saying is, and, and the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And it is. Because when you're giving, you're serving. You're doing for others. You're helping others. And at the same time, you're giving a blessing. How many times have you gone to make, Scott, you, you thought about this when you visited Pastor Steve yesterday. That you go to try to bless someone and you end up getting the blessing instead? Amen. How many times do you think that you're being a blessing to someone and you walk away and you're the one that's blessed? That's what, we, that's what God wants us to do. That's how He promises to, to give us happiness and joy and true fulfillment in our lives. He tells us that we'll lack nothing if we put our trust in the lives on Him. Lack for nothing that we need. Now, there are things that I want. There are things that I would love to have. I don't know if you see that thing going around on Facebook. I would love to have that that trailer, that camping trailer thing that's going around. You get it done and you share it, you know. I would love to have that. But that's not a need. That's a desire. That's a want. That's a want. I have a roof over my head. I'm very thankful that I have a roof over my head. I'm thankful that God helps me put food on my table each and every day. I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful that I have the opportunity to join this family and share God's word with you. I'm very thankful for those things. But God wants us to be thankful. He wants us to serve others. He wants us to be obedient. He wants us to know that every single person has equal value. This rich fool had set himself above everybody else. I'm this way. I'm going to prepare for me. This is all about me, 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 me. And God said, we're all equal. In God's sight, nobody is valued any more than anyone else. So today I want to ask us a question in regard to this parable that we've heard. What is important to you? What is it that's priority in your life? Is it preparing for yourself? Is it making sure that you're taken care of? Is it making sure that you get what you need irregardless of what people's needs are around you? What is important to you? What is it that takes up most of your time and your energy? Are you constantly talking with yourself about what you're going to do? Or are you seeking God's will? Because God tells us that we need to seek Him first. Seek Him first. And everything else can come on the place. Draw near to God. Draw near to God. How do you view the blessings you receive from God? Do you feel like you earn them? Do you act like they belong to you and that, that this is my blessing and nobody's going to take it away from me? Or do you share that blessing? You know, we share praise requests, praises during our prayer requests. Those are encouraging to us. Those lift us up and help us to understand that God is at work. God loves us. God values us. God is doing great things among us. Those things encourage us. So how do you, how do you look at your blessings? 
same thing? And are you prideful and say, tough people got me for me? Because I did whatever. God blesses both the righteous and the righteous. He makes it rain on everybody. I don't know about y'all. We got rain yesterday. Did anybody else get rain yesterday? Okay. So God rains on everybody. So, but, you know, are we prideful about those blessings? Are we willing to share what God has given us? You know, there are people here with talents and people here with skills and things, gifts that they can, that they can share. And they're not sharing. You know, we have a praise team. We have a children's ministry. There are other things in this church. And we need to share those things that God has given to us. Because the Bible tells us that the whole purpose of the church is to edify and to build up. So are we doing it? Are we building each other up? Are we edifying each other? Are we doing our part? Are we being a part of that body? What are we doing with our time? Do we love God freely? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. When we love other people, it's loving them as Christ loved them. Not as we love but as Christ loved which is a totally different love because we don't have that in and of ourselves. We have to get that from God. I had I had an issue with a person several months ago, and I was really struggling with it because I was just being around them. Just, you know how that is. Has everybody been around people like that? It's just you cringe every time you see them or you're in a meeting with them and you're just like, oh, I don't want to hear them speak kind of thing. And I was really struggling with that. And one morning in my devotions, I came across a passage of scripture. And it made me think, would I die for that person? And I said, no. He was going to be around. And then it came to me, Jesus did. Jesus died for that person. Just as he died for me. Jesus died for that person. Amen. So who am I to not love someone that Jesus loved so much that he died for? How do you value your relationship with God? What is that uh, value to you? Do, you? do you look forward to that with him every day? Do you look forward to, to communing with God, to having the devotion time with God? Do you look forward to that time? Is he a priority in your life? Because if he's not, you're going to be like this fool. You're going to be all about yourself, all about I, me, mine. Be on his word and seek his counsel. You follow what he leads you to do. How do you calculate your riches? This man calculated his riches and thought, i got to build bigger barns. How do you calculate your riches? Where is your treasure? Because where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Are you, are you building up riches here? Because they're not going to last. They're temporary. What's here is very temporary. Jesus' ministry was all about heavenly things, not earthly. So where are your riches? How do you calculate how rich you are? Do you feel rich? Do you feel rich in Christ? Yes. Because that's what God wants us to do. The rich fool, he's made his own plans. He had built bigger barns. He thought he had it all taken care of. And God says, he's cool. Because tonight's the night. And then what's going to happen to everything you have? When you leave this earth, what are you going to leave with? It doesn't matter what you're going to take with you because you're not going to take anything with you. So what are you going to leave here? This past week was a year that my mom passed away. And my mom left an amazing legacy with her family. My mom left an amazing testimony. I'll share that some of that with you the last week. My mom left an amazing legacy for her children. And that's something that we live through what she taught us. And that's what, I, what we tell each other is, is continue to live the things that we were taught. Continue to honor her memory. Continue to do the things that will bring honor and glory to God. And that's what she, how she lived her life. She had so much riches. She lived in a, I don't know, maybe thousand square foot home. So by our standards or human standards, not very rich. And that was a little, had one little bedroom, had a little kitchen, had a little area where actually like a living room, but her bedroom was set up in that. Not very rich. She didn't have a lot of things. Didn't own a car. Didn't have a lot of things at all. She was so rich in Jesus Christ. She was so rich in Jesus Christ. And she shared those riches. She shared those riches. And when it was time for her to go home, she was no fool. Because God had allowed her to have riches here on earth that she could share with others because they were heavenly God alone can bring us that happiness. 
God alone can give us the riches that we need in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's live in God's riches. Let's not live in the eyes of the people.